Hey everybody and welcome to episode 5 of Performance Max for Developers. My name is Devin, I'm a Developer Relations Engineer supporting the Google Ads API and today we're going to be talking about asset groups. Now this is a really exciting topic in my opinion because asset groups are really kind of the crux of Pmax campaigns. As I mentioned in the first episode, Google uses automation technologies in order to serve the right ads, which are generated dynamically to the right people at the right times using budget allocation. But we provide signals to that technology in order to do all that. These asset groups are exactly how we do that. Now, before we jump in, just a quick reminder, if you're finding this content useful, if you like these videos, please hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with our latest videos. All right, let's dive in. If you've been following along in this series, you've probably seen this diagram quite a few times now. It's a very simplistic view of how we represent our valid serving performance max campaign. In the last episode, we covered those first two items, the campaign and campaign budget. In this episode, we're going to cover the asset group and related entities, or we'll focus more on the asset group related entities in future episodes. But as you can see there, we're attaching our assets to our asset group. But let's look at this in a more realistic view to get an idea of what is an asset group. Well, it's probably exactly what you imagined, a collection of assets, right? Except not exactly. We don't add the assets to the asset group. So as I've discussed several times by now throughout this series, in Pmax, we're moving towards this shift of having an account level asset library. And we attach the assets in that asset library with a mechanism called an asset group asset. But there's more to an asset group than just that. For example, we can also attach listing group filters to an asset group to form a product partition tree for retail campaigns. This is something I brought up in the last episode about Pmax Retail, and we'll go into more detail about this in the next episode. And we can also attach asset group signals for advanced audience targeting. As I've said, asset groups are a great way to provide signals to Google Ads to optimize the serving of our ads. With an asset group signal, we can provide a reference to an audience ID to let Google know what kinds of audiences we think would convert very well. And then finally, we also have some fields on the asset group itself, including its name, the final URLs and mobile URLs we want to target, as well as the asset group status. So this here is really a great visual representation of the asset group and all of its related components as we're going to create them in the Google Ads API. All of these entities, with the exception of the asset creation, will be included in the bulk mutate request that we create. As a result, we need to use temporary IDs when referring to all these different objects. And I've provided arrows here to show you how we're going to use those temporary IDs. For example, if you take a look at the asset group box here, there are arrows pointing away from it towards asset group assets, listing group filters, and asset group signals. That means that we'll use the resource name of the asset group with the temporary ID in each one of those entities that we create. So now that we have a good visual representation of the asset group and its related entities, let's actually take a step back. And now we can look at that very simplified picture in more detail. So this is a visual representation of a valid serving Pmax campaign as we'll create it using the Google Ads API. And now you can see that we have our campaign, our campaign budget, asset library all the way on the left, and now the items in that light yellow, those are all our asset group entities. And this is everything that's going to be included in our bulk mutate request. And the same holds true about the arrows and the temporary IDs. And as I've alluded to before, we can also do this with multiple asset groups. So in this case, we still have one asset library, we have one campaign and one campaign budget, but we have several asset groups here. And the number of asset groups will dictate the number of asset group assets we have, the number of listing group filters we have, as well as the number of asset group signals. 
And then finally, we'll zoom out one step more, and this brings us back to the diagram that we saw in the first episode, which represents everything that we're going to do in the entire code walkthrough. So at this point, I want to take a step back before jumping into the code to explain what the asset groups are actually doing and why we might want to have multiple different asset groups in a single campaign. So let me introduce you or reintroduce you to my fictional store, Devin's Music Mania. We sell instruments. As you can see, we have a campaign budget, our campaign settings, and some conversion goals at the high level. I have two different product types that I want to target. I have drums and I have guitars. So what I'm going to do is create a different asset group for each one. And as you can see, each has a different name, each has final URLs that it's targeting that are different, and we also attach assets to each one. And some of the assets might be the same, like our business assets that you can see at the bottom in the middle, or we might have specific assets related to one asset group or the other, in which case we won't attach them to both. Finally, if we have audiences for these specific product types, what we can do is associate them at the asset group level. So we're here in the interactive guide, and I just want to show you a simple example of an integration. So on the left here, we've got some form fields, and I filled this out. And what I'm doing is I'm aggregating these into a list of a class I'm calling Asset Group Metadata. Now, let's scroll down to that class just to see how we're actually constructing it and what sort of information is important to us. All right, so we're down here and we can see I'm keeping track of three different items. One is the temporary asset group ID. As I've mentioned many times by now, this is a bulk mutate operation. Each asset group must have its own temporary ID and each one must be unique. In addition, I have the actual asset group, which I create in the constructor method here. And then finally, I have the audience ID. And I wanna track that separately because the operation to create an asset group signal using an audience ID is a separate operation than creating the asset group itself. Creating the asset group is pretty self-explanatory. I'm just setting all the fields that I defined above. The one thing I want to point out though is the use of this temporary ID to set our resource name. And whereas we had constant values for both our campaign operation and our campaign budget operation, there's an unknown number of asset groups in this particular code example. So what I'm going to do is generate a new temporary ID every single time I create a new asset group. I'm going to keep track of all these different temporary IDs in a list that I've created at the class level. That way I can reference them later. And I'll show you where we do that in the next episode about listing group filters. So as I mentioned just a minute ago, we have that audience ID that we're also keeping track of. We enter that here. And I've kind of nested that within the asset group operation form over here because I wanted to emphasize that this is really a different operation altogether, even though they're related entities. And here's the method that we would use in order to create that asset group signal. Now, finally, if I wanted, I can also add another asset group here. Like I said before, let's do one for guitars. So now I have some information entered for my guitars asset group. And for this one, I haven't entered an audience ID, so I'm not going to create an asset group signal. And that's indicated by this null value here, whereas for the drums asset group, there's an actual ID. Now, if we just take a final look at what we're doing here, we're just going to loop through this list of asset group metadata. For each one, we'll create a resource name for that asset group using the temporary ID that we generated in the asset group metadata class. We'll create an operation using the asset group that we created, and then we'll add each one to our list of operations that we'll return at the end of this method. And then finally, as you can see here, if the asset group metadata has an audience ID, we'll also create and add an asset group signal operation to our list of operations that we'll return at the end of this method. And the last thing I want to point out here is that you'll notice that the operation to create the asset group signals follows the operation to create each asset group. And that's because when we perform bulk mutate requests, we can't reference an object that hasn't been created yet. If we look back at that method to create an asset group signal, 
you can see here that we set the asset group with the asset group resource name, which means that the asset group that we're referencing here must come prior in the list of operations to this one. I hope you now have a much deeper understanding of what asset groups are, how we create them, what these related entities are that I kept referring to, and some design patterns for integrating with your application. In the next episode, we'll dive back into retail campaigns when we look at product partition trees and listing group filters. I'll see you next time.